because I, I mean, I know how to teach through the book of Revelation, but it's just, I feel overwhelmed, and that's a good thing. I feel inadequate, that's a good thing. There's just something about teaching the book of Revelation that, um, I mean, any part of the Bible that you're teaching, you ought to be in fear and trembling, but this just feels like overdrive. So I feel like a little bit difficult to, to start with, and maybe that's, that's a good cue for us to start with um, the Revelation song. Wesley, are we able to do that yes, now? And I've got our dear friend, Pastor Crystal, doing this song. So, um, you know, let me read you this verse in Revelation 1 that really stands out to me. Revelation 1 and um, verse 10. John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice. But he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I think about Zacharias, who came into the temple. Was it Zechariah or um, Simeon? I think it was Simeon who came into the temple in the spirit. And I remember studying the book of Revelation with my professor at Regent University, J. Robin Williams, and he really made an impact on me in a number of ways, but he strongly emphasized studying the book of Revelation in the Spirit. That is, by the Holy Spirit or through the Holy Spirit. Now, we do that anyway, any book that we study, but the fact that John mentions that so early in the book of Revelation, he'll mention it again in Revelation chapter 4, says something to us. And how do we study Revelation in the Spirit? How is it that we can come in the Spirit? And really, it, it begins simply through humility and dependence and asking, asking Him to fill us and to lead us and to guide us and to teach us, knowing that's what He wants to do. This isn't something that we're asking Him that He's reluctant to. But in order for us to get as much as possible uh, out of this course, and more specifically out of the book of Revelation, hopefully I can remember to emphasize utter dependence upon the Holy Spirit to absorb everything that we can. And he does want to give us um, all that we can handle. He knows how much we can handle. We, we can handle more than we think we can as well. So. One of the other ways to be able to be in the Spirit is through worship. And Revelation is a book of worship. Revelation 4 and 5 are worship songs. And there are other um, songs in Revelation. So it's a, it's a book of encouragement. It's a, it's a pastoral book. We might think of Revelation as a book of judgment, but it's actually a book of grace. Before every act of judgment, there's always, it's always preceded by God's grace, uh, abounding grace, more than abundant grace. It's a, it's a book that is written to build up a suffering church, to encourage a suffering church, to give a suffering church perspective. If We may not be suffering, but if you know anything about the church in China or the church in North Korea or the church in Nigeria, you know that the church is suffering in ways that we can't even imagine. They need encouragement, right? We need encouragement as well because we go through our own suffering, trials, etc. It may not be overt persecution, but God, I think, is not, he is not gonna let us play patty cake while our brothers and sisters in Niger, Nigeria are being hacked to death or burned alive or churches demolished in China or uh, unspeakable horrific things happening to Christians in North Korea so we can't we have to have uh, um, some sort of commonality with them there's a fellowship in suffering so we can try to put our our minds in that first century church that was heavily persecuted by the Roman government and uh, resisted the Christian faith at every turn, especially when they were talking about the Lord and Savior. 
Domitian called himself the Lord and Savior. So that's not going to fly. When, when Christians are saying we worship the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he says, no, I am the Lord and Savior. That, that's a scary thing. And so the book of Revelation is written to encourage a persecuted, suffering church. That's important for us to understand. But it's also written as a severe warning to non-believers. Well, first, God, the Lord Jesus, has some strong things to say to the seven churches. He has some encouraging things to say to them, but he also has some very strong things to say to them. Um, but judgment begins in the house of the Lord. That's Revelation 2 and 3. And then it moves out to the world. Revelation 6 through um, really the end of Revelation. And But even in the warnings lies grace. So God always in his warnings that these are gracious warnings to repent because eternity is at stake. So I'm giving a little bit of an overview of the book of Revelation, but I think it's important for us to understand before we get into it that it's not primarily a book of judgment. It's primarily a book of grace. It's primarily a book of worship. It's primarily a book of encouragement. So just like any other book in the Bible, it equips us, it ministers to us, it strengthens us in a lot of ways. And so I just want to build those expectations but ultimately that we would study it in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And one of the ways we can do that is, uh, for those of you who are new, we always, almost always start off a class with praise and worship. And um, so we're going to do that now with a Revelation song. That means a great deal to me. I was able to lead a, um, a Footsteps of Paul and Footsteps of John trip several years ago. And we were able to be in the cave on the island of Patmos where John wrote the book of Revelation. Got some pretty amazing stories there. And um, someone spontaneously, I had to get through a lot of work, get effort from the Orthodox priest to allow us to worship in, in that cave. And um, it, was, it was a move of God that enabled him to, moved upon him to say yes. And then he promptly left. And I said to everybody, I said, we can worship one song, and that's it. And normally I always have a song in my mind, and I said, I don't know. And someone just, the Revelation song had just come out, I think, at that point. And we began to sing it a cappella, and there wasn't a dry eye in the place. It was just a really right where John wrote this book. I've got some pictures of that as well. So um, let's pray, and then will worship. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get the words to the song, but I think you'll pick them up um, easily enough. So, Father, we, we look to you now and we thank you for uh, this book of Revelation, the unveiling of Jesus. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are our master teacher and that you desire to lead us and guide us into all of your truth so that we can be conformed into the image of our Savior. And so we yield our time to you today. We yield this class to you over the next um, eight weeks. And I'm saying class, but it but really is a study. But let it be more than a study. Let it be an encounter with you. Would you fill us with your spirit so that we can study uh, this word of yours in the spirit, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, with the delight of the Holy Spirit, leading us to a deeper love of the Father and of the Son. And we, we offer these prayers to you now in faith and expectation that you would do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine according to your great power that mightily works within us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You ready? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's that one. I think Sorry, it's the 1244. Yeah, yeah. And if you can make it. And this is where communion starts. And 
and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, Jesus took our place. You know, it should have been you and I that were up on that cross. It should have been you and I paying our sins off, our transgressions. But it was Jesus that took our place. He gave his body for us so that we can enter into freedom and to thanksgiving. And so it is here in communion that we need to remember the incredible things that Jesus did for us. So if you would take your bread. Jesus, we thank you for giving your body. Lord, we thank you for what you did on the cross for us. We love you, Lord, for this. And we remember what you've done. You can take the bread with me. continues and likewise the cup after they had eaten saying this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood sin had a cost and through the blood of Jesus which was poured out on the cross for you and for me we are now made clean we're forgiven we are now at we are now standing right righteous before the Lord because of what Jesus did for us by pouring out his blood for us. So as we remember, you can take the cup. Jesus, we thank you for pouring out your blood for us, being the ultimate sacrifice, that you've washed away our sins, that you loved us so much that you would do that for us. And we stand here in complete thanksgiving for what you've done. You can take the cup with me.
And he came out and went, as was... This is part of our inheritance. This is part of our destiny. Now John says, After these things I looked, uh, Revelation 4, 1, And behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, which is chapter 1, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting on the throne, who he was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Verse 5, Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion and the second creature like a cat. And the third creature had a face like that of a man and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within and day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, who was, and who is, and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders will fall down before Him who sits on the throne, and will worship Him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are You, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Chapter 5, verse 1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book? And to break its seals. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Verse 4, then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome, has conquered so as to open the book and its seven seals. Verse 6, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. 
And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever and the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped isn't that amazing this is for us this is for them who were wondering if you, Lord Jesus, are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Why are you not stopping this? They were tempted, sorely tempted, to wonder if he had abandoned them. Why are we suffering so greatly? But in comes God the Father giving this revelation through Jesus Christ, the Son, to reveal to us what's happening in the spiritual realm and where history is headed right now it doesn't look like history is headed very well uh, in any good place and it is not going to get any better i wish i could say it will until jesus christ returns to this earth and he rules it and reigns it in complete peace justice and righteousness with you and with me we are his kingdom we are priests we are going to rule and reign with him throughout the thousand year state on this earth where the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the kid and, and all the things that Isaiah prophesies. And we are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years and then into the eternal state in the new heaven and in the new earth. Now do we know all these things are gonna happen because every single thing that God has prophesied in Scripture that has was supposed to come to pass has come to pass. That lets us know that everything else that is written by the authoritative, inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God is going to be fulfilled as well. Just Abraham alone. God took him outside and said, look up in the stars of heaven. Count them if you can. So will be the number of your descendants. Has that been fulfilled? Is it being fulfilled? <coughs> Absolutely. So we can be confident that this, this word, God is going to have the last word. He is going, sin will not have the last word. The revelation is a book of redemption. And its, its invitation is open to all. Not all will receive that invitation. We know that. But, but, in describing the book of Revelation, it is preeminently a book of redemption. In fact, the whole Bible is, is a story of God's effort to redeem lost and sinful and rebellious man. Just look at the life of the Apostle Paul, who killed many of our brothers and sisters in Christ that we will see when we get to heaven, put many of them in jail, and God turned that man around and redeemed him as, as 
a major trophy of grace. So he is a redeemer, and he's going to give us supernatural resurrected bodies. And we will never, as we'll see in Revelation 21, there will be no death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness, no more disease, no more war, but complete healing and total restoration. That also is the book of Revelation. All right, well, let's go into the, uh, the PowerPoint and um, stop me, um, John and Terry, my style of teaching is I love to get q and I love to get interaction, but I have a tendency to drive at 90 miles an hour, so sometimes you just have to stop me, hold your hand up, and I'll, do, and I'll stop, um, usually right on the spot. Sometimes I might finish my thought. And um, can you all see this? Are you okay seeing it? Squinting a little bit? Um, you know what I think I'll do is I'll just turn my so whether it was written in 90 AD that's when Revelation was written it was the last book of the Bible or 3,000 years ago as is most of the Old Testament I think it's a stunning thing to contemplate that a book written so long ago to different cultures in different languages can have such a major impact in the lives of those who open their hearts and their minds and their lives to it. No other book in the world can it, uh, of no other book in the world can it be said that the Bible is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We're going to see that mentioned here in Revelation as well. The Apostle John states at the outset, Revelation 1, I'm going to read Revelation uh, 1 verses 1 through 4. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, that is the Father, gave him to show to his bondservants. Are you a bondservant of Christ Jesus? So it's for you. It's The book of Revelation is written for you. It's written for me. It's ours. It belongs to us. It's part of our inheritance. To show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now you may recall that in 1 John, in 1 John chapter 1, John says, what was from the beginning, that what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, revealed, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen, John wants to emphasize that we have seen him. He is not, the Docetics at the time said Jesus only appeared as a man. He wasn't really a man because flesh and material are evil and God wouldn't have anything to do with that. That was an overriding heresy in the church. And so John wants to emphasize both the deity and the humanity of Jesus to the church. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you may, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So John, who writes the book of Revelation, wrote those three epistles and of course the Gospel of John as well. But he states at the outset in Revelation 1 that what he writes is literally we our word is revelation. But in Greek, it's the apocalypsis or the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The Greek word has been trans translated revelation or unveiling specifically of the exalted Jesus who is in heaven. So it's the unveiling of one who is in his heavenly glory. It's an unveiling of his present that is invisible and future visible and physical reign upon the earth. 
This is meant to encourage us, especially today as we're living in the last days and we see the world crumbling uh, faster than we can grab hold of. Now, the four Gospels describe Jesus' earthly life um, and his ministry and glory with glimpses on the Mount of Transfiguration, other things of his, of his deity and, and other areas. But after his resurrection and ascension into heaven, the Gospels are silent about him. Thus, the benefit in the providence of God, in the wisdom of God, revealing to us Jesus in his ascension and his all his power and glory and showing us what is coming to us as well so that we can be prepared. <clears throat> Think about how God thinks of us and loves us, that he would give us the book of Revelation for us. And what does John say? I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit. In Revelation 1, um, uh, continue on in verse 3, look at this, blessed, this word is emphatic, it means privileged, a recipient of God's favor, it means to be happy, blessed, just like in the, in the um, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And there are several uh, Beatitudes like this throughout Revelation, I think, I think actually seven. Blessed is the one who reads, present participle, and those who hear, present participle, the words of the prophecy, and heed, present participle, the things which are written in it, for the time is near. You see, that's wide open. That's for every generation of Christian. It's the only book in the Bible that pronounces a blessing on those who read, hear, and obey. The only book in the Bible. So you see, Revelation has so much to say to us, and it's, it, it's a tragedy that Christians are not more interested in it. And in part, we understand why, because there's so many different interpretations. How do we interpret Revelation? There's so much speculation, um, and it can be confusing and it can be intimidating. So my goal in dependence upon the Holy Spirit is to try to take away the intimidation factor and to give us sound tools of interpretation. So this is not going to be a course where I'm going to go off and speculate and this is what this is and this is what this is, unless we have some sort of historical background, some sort of cultural background, some sort of indication within the text. Um, and, and frankly, a lot of the things that are going to take place in Revelation, we won't fully understand until they take place. I'll give you some examples of that as we move through it. So is it an easy book to understand? No, it's not. But there are things throughout Scripture that are not, not necessarily easy. But that is where, um, and I'm not... I think most of you know I am not a self-promoter, so it's it's not easy for me to even hold this up. But um, if you, I just want you to understand the work that has gone into it. If you just look at the bibliography in the back, this is how much work I put into it. And um, I studied the book of Revelation in the original Greek language. So this is not some, it's not my opinion. It's not some fluff thing. It's rigorous. Um, scholarship, but what you see is what you're experiencing now. It's just me teaching. There's a lot of praying going on in this book. There's a lot of speaking to the church, but there is um, non-stop definition of words, explanation of backgrounds. Um, what did the symbols mean to the people that it was written to? Why does John use simile? It was like this. Why does he use metaphor? There are reasons for that. And the job of a teacher is to bring those out to the current generation so that it can be palatable for us. So that's kind of the background. I, I just want to urge you to, to get this, especially because even now I'm really struggling on what do I skip over. And even to mention the word skip over is painful for me. But... I do feel like it's important for us to get through Revelation 22. So, so the idea, for example, I'm thinking I might have to skip over Revelation 2 and 3. 
You don't want to skip over anything in Revelation. But if you read this, then I'm actually teaching you through Revelation 2 and 3 or anything else that I might have to, I might not be able to get into in depth. So, um, but, but just so that we can understand, this is for us. It was written to the first century believers, but the amazing miracle of Scripture is it is it is written to us as well. But we have to be careful with the Word of God to interpret it in its original context. If we don't do that, that's where we go astray. That's where we make mistakes. And so that's my pledge to you is to is to be diligent to say what did it originally mean to them so that we can understand and apply best in our life. Um, so that's what Revelation is. It's an unveiling of Jesus and all of his resurrection glory and power. Um, John's task in Revelation is to take a heavenly vision of Jesus, faithfully report his words to the seven churches of Asia Minor. So that's important to understand. John was the apostle over all those churches. And he lived in Ephesus. I'll show you some pictures of um, the basilica that was built for him in the either the 4th or 6th century by the Emperor Justinian. It's still there. The ruins are still there. And so the church in Ephesus has an extraordinary history, extraordinarily influential, where Paul planted the church, but Timothy pastored it, and then eventually John oversaw it as well. And um, so it was directed to the churches in a circular, it was a circular letter. I'll show you a, a picture of that. It starts in Ephesus and then makes its way ultimately all the way around to Laodicea, again to encourage the churches who were suffering at this time. Um, but so he's taking a heavenly vision of Jesus to faithfully report his words to the seven churches of Asia Minor. When we hear the word Asia, we don't think of Asia like we're familiar with. This is modern-day Turkey. And, um, and then to articulate his plans for the world from what he saw into human language. So how do you, how do you, if we were suddenly able to go back into the 1700s here in Virginia, and we want to communicate to the people living in those times what an air conditioner is, because they don't have air conditioning. Or we have cell phones. I, I can imagine they would, they would get a little fearful. Or what if they saw worship like we just saw here? How, how would they, but you're trying to explain something to them. Well, here's what is gonna happen in the future, but they have no reference point. They have no cell phones. They don't even have a dial-up phone. They have no cars. They have, you know, the day is coming when you're gonna be able to sit into a room and click on a button and the temperature will be much cooler inside than it is outside. How do you explain that to them? How do you explain that the day is coming when you're gonna be able to fly to wherever you wanna go or you're gonna be able to uh, read anything you want at the click of a button. It, how do you explain? So you're going to have to use, well, it's like this. Or you're going to have to use metaphors to explain to them in a world they have no clue what we're used to. And, and before you actually show them, so we're going back in time, and we're saying here's what the future holds, you're going to have to use symbolism and figures of speech and metaphor. Likewise, John is caught up in heaven in the future. He's seen things that the people on earth are not used to. We're not used to four living creatures with eyes in and around. If you press that literally, in this case, that might seem grotesque, right? But, but when you understand that everything God created is good, Genesis 1, and you will be amazed, it's in my commentary, how many verses, I think there's 404 verses in Revelation, it seems like there'd be more than that, and more than 300 are, 
are quoting the Old Testament. It's substantially dependent upon the Old Testament. Um, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Um, but anyway, it's in order for it just to help us understand why is there some, why can't you just tell us exactly what it is? Well, John is in heaven and he's in the future. He's trying to explain to us now, albeit in with ideas that we can, for the most part, understand, that is the reason for the symbolism. So it's no easy task. John's attempting to describe heavenly things into earthly language. So that means we've got to be patient. We've got to roll our sleeves up, got to work a little bit at it to be able to gain the meaning of the book of Revelation. He's also trying to describe future events to a current generation. And so he, he has to make use of a great deal of symbolism, metaphor, simile, like we've already seen some of these similes in what we read in Revelation 4 and 5, figures of speech to explain what he's seen and heard, and that is the nature of apocalyptic literature, which you see in Daniel and you see in Ezekiel as well. So we're not too familiar with apocalyptic literature unless we read Daniel, unless we read Revelation or Ezekiel. The rest of the Bible is not apocalyptic, but it is very much prophetic. But John's revelation is also a prophecy, as we're going to see in just a moment. But the idea, the root idea of apocalyptic is a dualism of two ages, according to which this age is one of wickedness, this present evil age is what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians, and persecution for the saints of God. The church has always been persecuted. Paul uh, met with, uh, in his second missionary journey in Acts 14, 22, he, he met with the churches that he had already planted to encourage them and say to them, through many tribulations, we must inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we're not hearing that in the church world today. We're hearing triumph, victory, faith, prosperity, and all those things. Well, that's, that's not a balanced gospel. There's also the theology of the cross. And, and Revelation will talk about that, although it's a book of victory as well. I think, um, yeah, the subtitle I've got here is The Grace of God and the Victorious Believer in Jesus Christ. It seems like an irony or a contradiction, but it's not. Um, so the turning point... So uh, persecution for the saints of God and the next age, which is one of triumph and vindication. So all that we have suffered at the hands of the evil one or evil people, we are going to be vindicated. Not one thing is going to be left unvindicated for us. Not one. God's got everything in his book. He is for us. He is going to restore everything. He's going to redeem everything. He's going to heal everything. The climactic part of that uh, can be re read in Revelation 21 and then in Revelation 22, which we'll, we'll, we must spend a lot of time in. So the turning point comes in a sudden dramatic intervention by God who has been silently working out his purposes in the world up to that time. So... There's the kingdom of God right now. It's present, but it's, it's already, but it's not yet. It's not here in its fullness. It is a spiritual reign, but eventually it will be spiritual and visible and material over all the world. Finally, the message of Apocalyptus, uh, Daniel and Ezekiel and Seers is one of consolation and hope, offering a theodicy. What is a theodicy? It's a justification of the ways of God to men. It's a justification of the ways of God to men. What, do we, what kind of a world do we live in? We live in a world where man sits in judgment of God, right? Man is always saying, I'm not going to believe in a God who allows evil. If God is so powerful, then why, does he, why doesn't he stop evil? Why doesn't he stop suffering? While God is saying, why aren't you stopping evil? Why aren't you stopping suffering? You're created in my image and according to my likeness. I've given the ability to do good, but you're doing wicked instead, and you blame me for it. Proverbs 19.2 says, The foolishness of man subverts his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. Such is the hypocritical nature of man who 
who only understands so much justice accusing God of being unjust. Such is the hypocritical nature of man who is highly imperfect in love at best questioning the love of God. Such is the hypocritical nature of man who understands goodness to a modicum and can't even do good all the time sitting in judgment of God and questioning his goodness without even reading this. But those are smoke screens to be able to keep one's sinful lifestyle. That's when you unveil the whole thing, you realize what's really going on. Man loves his sin more than God. That's Jesus diagnoses that in John 3, 16 through 21. Betty? How do you spell that word, theodicy? I can't think of that. Theodicy, uh, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. A justification of the ways of God to men. The seer expresses the assurance that all is safe in God's hands despite the present stress, and the end is certain as history unfolds along its predetermined course in establishing God's rule, and notice how I italicize that, in his new world order. You hear a lot about man talking about the new world order. It's just... It's just sin recycled, and, and it looks differently. But God has a new world order, and it's already begun through the church. So that's why we're so important. Is we are his, John Stott, in his commentary on Ephesians, calls it God's new society. We are a new society. We are the church of the living God. We, we carry the truth of the word of God. We carry the presence of the word of God to a world that is dying around us. And one person said, you are the only Jesus that someone might ever see. Or Paul says, we are living epistles known and read by all men. And so it's much more than coming on Sunday. It's as we go out in unity and love and respect and honor in reverence to God under the loving authority of his word that we move out and we reveal aspects of the kingdom of God and of the future to the world. Well, the early church took that seriously. For 300 years, they were persecuted. But it's books like Revelation that enabled them to stand firm. And eventually, the Roman Empire embraced the Christian faith. It's just one of the greatest stories in history that we don't know about. 300 years the churches were persecuted across the Roman Empire. I've got a slide to show you the extensive, um, how extensive the Roman Empire was. But in 313 AD, Constantine had a vision of Jesus. And in that vision, he saw a cross and the words were conquered by this, the cross. In some ways he took that the wrong way, but in many ways that's when the persecution of the church ended. And the ending of persecution had some unintended consequences that weren't good for the church. But, but that's what happened because the church understood. They're the one, the Romans didn't care about, uh, they didn't care about uh, children. So if they, like China had a one child policy, and so if it was a girl, then the Chinese were required to abort it. Well, likewise, in that society, if a girl was born, this is pretty, pretty intense. They took the little baby, the female baby, <clears throat> out into the woods and left it there, all right? So you know what happened after that. The Christians would watch what was going on. When the person would leave, the Christians would run and grab the baby and bring that little girl up. The Christians cared for the sick and the dying when the Romans wanted nothing to do with the sick and dying. The Christians were the ones that educated little children that weren't part of the upper echelon. The Christians were the ones that started hospitals and schools and 
societies to help the unfortunate. Well, the Romans were perplexed and befuddled. Why? I mean, none of us care about anybody but our own. Why do you care? And that gave the church an opportunity to share the gospel of redemption and how their sins were forgiven and they saw people now from God's viewpoint as valuable, as created in his image and according to his likeness. That's the story of the church throughout the world. Without the church, this world would be a horrific place. That's why we, we are doers of the word. We, we minister to people. Well, who else can do that? No one has eternal life, has, has the ability to give eternal, or the message of eternal life. And so we're his new society. We're part of a new world order that is going to dominate eventually, but not yet. So now we need to persevere. Tragically, Christians today are ignorant of, of this book at a time when we need it more now than ever. Christians today seem easily offended at the mere thought that God would bring his judgment and wrath upon the wicked, and justly so. How is it? We're, we think like the world. Really. And that's a dangerous thing. And so it seems pastors and church members alike simply avoid or ignore revelation. However, they also miss out on this book of grace, encouragement, worship. That's why I read Revelation 4 and 5, to introduce us to this idea of worship. A uh, hope heaven, eternal redemption, rest and restoration. Oh, I can't wait to show you that this world is only a pattern of what already exists in heaven. We're going to see that again and again and again. Continuity between heaven and earth, earth and heaven, and discontinuity. We're going to see that there's learning in heaven. There are animals in heaven. There uh, are clothes in heaven. There is food in heaven. There's Everything that we're used to now is already in heaven, albeit in a perfect state. I think in sports terms, it'd be like playing baseball on uh, some of these old little league uh, fields that are no longer in use. And, you know, the ground is hard and the outfield's got divots in there. That's You just don't want to play there. It'd be like playing on a baseball field there compared to, say, Camden Yards in Baltimore, where the Orioles play, or better, San Francisco, where the Giants play. It was a massive stadium, and you will walk in and it's, oh my gosh. Or your garden, which is beautiful. I haven't seen it, but I know you, so I know it's got to be nice. Then, Betty, you step into heaven with your eternal home, and the garden is as big as the state of Virginia. And you've got, you will be astonished at the color of the flowers, the plants, the trees, the fruit. And for God, that's nothing. And not, it won't die. So presumably you will have to plant new plants every year. So there's continuity, but there's discontinuity. I don't know what's up with that high rise, but as you get right up to the high rise, I mean, that car is bouncing up and down. They can't fix a thing right. But in heaven, you've got streets of gold, clear as glass. You have streets, you have buildings here on earth and in heaven, trees, streams, so on and so forth. So that when we get to heaven, we're not going to be shocked as some ethereal place that doesn't make any sense to us, we're going to say, oh, yes, of course. But this is so vastly superior to that. Fishing. Now, I'm not quite sure how that all is going to work, that you'll actually eat the fish or kill the fish. I, I don't think that's where that's going. But somehow, the learning of, of instruments, which I'm looking forward to, I've said before. And, um, and I read that. Um, in Revelation 4 this morning. So you'll see that Revelation is so much more relevant than you've ever thought or realized. Relevant to your life. We'll learn to pray through Revelation as well. 
Um, let's see, so I got that. So this is where H. Richard Niebuhr uh, was a theologian in the 1930s, and he wrote this. This is where so much of today's church in America is headed, or is already at, following closely on the heels of apostate churches believing in this life. He said, this was the condition in 1937 that he addressed. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. Does that sound familiar today? Much of preaching today won't touch atonement and wrath and those kind of things. Revelation is also a prophecy. Revelation 1.3, um, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. So that lets us know that it's a prophetic book. Well, what's the nature of prophecy? We're going to learn about that. So, um, in part, a prophecy explains future events to the current first century audience. And it, it will, in, in many ways, it will be fulfilled or partially fulfilled at that time, but then ultimately fulfilled in the future. So then the miracle of God's inspiration of Scripture is that he enables us to understand his word in our own day and age. By the way, this is all introductory uh, comments, just to get us ready as we get into the text. So, yes, Joseph. So, what you meant is some of the prophecies has been fulfilled, some are halfway, and some to be broken in the future. Correct. Yeah. So, for example, um, the importance of Revelation two and three. Over and over and over again, I think there's only two churches that receive only commendation from the Lord and no rebuke. And the other five have been, um, they have not taken his word seriously. So there's heresies in the church, there's false teaching in the church, there's immorality in the church, and Jesus has something to say about that. And so he rebukes the churches and says, if you don't repent... I'm going to remove your lampstand out of its place. So you tell me of those seven churches, which city has a thriving Christian population today? None. Not one. They didn't really ultimately repent. There's no evangelical witness in Ephesus, Laodicea, Sardis, Philadelphia, Thyatira. None. None. Yes, in part, it's because the Muslims took over. But God can use the Muslims if he wants. Not that he ordains that to happen, but because they're not obeying him, takes his hands off and says, okay, this prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Is it being fulfilled throughout Europe? Africa used to be called the Dark Continent. No longer. If we're honest, Europe is the dark continent. There's thriving churches, but by and large, the Christian faith is, is dying fast, and it's happening in the United States of America as well. I want to be careful with some of the things. I have strong convictions. i got to be careful how I... So Revelation is also a prophecy. You see that several times in Revelation. Um, so it's imperative for us the third paragraph in the 21st century I mentioned this earlier to keep in mind that Revelation was written first and foremost to Christians living in the first century AD grave mistakes in interpretation and in application result when we fail in this vital discipline and that goes for all of scripture it's always taken out of context and you can take a verse out of context and build a doctrine on it if you're not careful to interpret it within its original historical cultural context. So revelation is no plaything. This is this is why I said I I mean I all day yesterday and all morning this morning just a <clears throat> dread, I'm feeling a dread, just the fear of God to teach this. 
This is not some eschatological periodical that we can throw around. It's, it's the Word of God. So it's no plaything limited to people who are only interested in eschatology. That's the study of last things. Eschaton, last, logos, ology, theology. Um, Revelation is also an essential book for us to know God's nature, for us to grow in Christ, for us to be equipped for ministry, uh, for us to be prepared for his return, and our eternal rule and reign together with him. Did you know that Revelation is full of that? Let's take a look. Let's look. We'll get ahead a little bit. Um, Revelation, let's look at those verses. Revelation 2 verses 25 through 27 and we'll just go right on through because personally but I know it's the Lord I want to give you a vision for eternity more than just the present more than Sunday or Monday but a vision for your eternity because this world is so, so short. Um, because God has a vision for us for eternity. He has plans for us for eternity. So Revelation 2.25, Jesus is speaking to the church in Thyatira. He's trying to get their attention. And so he says in verse 25, Nevertheless, what you have, there's the commendation, hold fast. Hold fast what you have until I come. Look at this offer of grace. He who overcomes, the word is victory. Nikeo, conquer, victorious. It's what he wants for us. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end. This is his deity. You're going to see his deity over and over and over in Revelation. He who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. So he who keeps my deeds to the end, Cynthia, Dr. Stevenson, Patricia, John Joyce, Wesley, all of us, we can insert our names in there. To him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. That is for those who rebel. Well, what is he quoting? He's, he's quoting from the Old Testament. You see the words are capitalized. He's quoting from Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm which is what God the Father speaks to God the Son. And now God the Son then, then gives this to us. This is extraordinary. This is stunning. This means that God has a plan for us, that we're going to rule and reign with him forever. Did you have something, Wesley? So this, you know, we're not just playing patty cake. We're not, you know, playing patty cake and singing a couple songs in church on Sunday, hearing a message, and then we go and live. But, but we're being trained for eternity. Matthew 5, verse 5, uh, Jesus says, um, Blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Is he going to entrust his rule and reign to arrogant Christians? Independent Christians? Rebellious Christians? I'd say not. Blessed are the hum the gentle, but it's really the Greek word is, is humble. Jesus refers to himself as humble in heart. For they shall inherit the earth. That's in Psalm 37. I'm going to preach about at, at uh, Covenant Community Church next Sunday. Um, to give us a vision for what the future holds. This is, this is big time stuff. Um, and then notice how he continues on. As I also received 
authority from my father. So that means we are going to be, we're already joint heirs. <laughs> we're going to rule and reign with him. Now precisely how? We only have a little bit of information. And I will give him the morning star. Well, if Jesus plans to give me the morning star, I, don't you think I should want to find out what that means? But then he always ends each message to each of the seven churches with the last words, he who has an ear. Didn't he say that in his earthly ministry? But now he says, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So now we see that the Holy Spirit is Lord over his church and says is in the present tense. So it's written there, but he's still speaking. And we can apply. Well, then how about uh, Revelation 3, 21 and 22? Twice he's emphasizing these things to the church. This is Laodicea. This is the church that is basically backslidden and almost apostate. But yet he appeals. There's the grace. Verse 21. No, verse, let's go to verse 20. This is the one we all know. Behold, I stand, present tense, at the door and knock. Present tense. Isn't that amazing? He stands at the door, meaning he's outside the church building, not inside. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears, anyone, anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. And he, and he would, that, that is the most intimate fellowship there is. We don't appreciate that in our culture, but in a Jewish culture, to... To have fellowship with someone, that is a wide open indication of intimate friendship. That's what this is all about. It's book of grace. He who overcomes, verse 21, I will grant to him to sit down with me, what does he say? On my throne. You think God has a vision for you? As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, none of us believe that. Do we? I don't think we do. I don't think you can't see yourself sitting with Jesus on his throne. Well, that means we need, we need some adjustments. We need to be able to believe what God is saying in his word. If he really means it. We who are his enemies, we were his children of wrath. It, he's taking us from as low as we can get all the way up to the top, the penthouse, to rule and reign with him. You think God has a vision for your life? But we wouldn't know that without the book of Revelation. How many Christians know this? Revelation 5.10, which we already read, you have made them um, no, let's go to, back to verse 9. Worthy are you to take the book. What is in that book? Well, the rest of Revelation is going to show. That's where chapter 6 through 19 come in. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. Why? For you were slain. See how he's the object of worship because of what he did. And you purchased for God with your blood, sinless blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. What's happening in this world today? Do, does every tribe, people, tongue, and nation get along? That's a test from God. It is a test. It's only the Christian that understands every single one of us bear his glory bear his image like he intentionally created us and placed us where he wanted us to be to reflect his glory we're created in his image and according to his likeness so knowing that then the Christian should give the highest honor to every tribe tongue nation, every nationality because I like to say, you tear down the work of God, 
you're tearing him down. So you don't want to touch that. But it's the redeemed Christian whose eyes are open, whose heart is open to treat everyone with dignity, honor, and respect. Because when we get to heaven, we're going to see, we're going to see everybody. And they're all redeemed. And what does he say? Every tribe and tongue and people and nation, everyone. How many billions of people do we have just now? Six billion? I, I don't know. That's a lot. Not that all of them are going to be redeemed, but, but he says, you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So we are part of the kingdom, and we are priests, men and women. What does a priest do? A priest serves God. A priest ministers to God. A priest ministers to others. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You see how God has dignified us. Isn't this Revelation is a book of dignity? It's really what it is. It's more than what we think it is. And we are going to reign upon the earth. First, upon this earth in the millennium, over the unsaved people. That'll rattle your head. In our resurrected bodies, and they don't have their resurrected bodies. Wait till we get to Revelation 20 on that one. And then in the new heavens and in the new earth, where the, the Jerusalem in heaven comes down to earth in which righteousness dwells and we are going to reign on a redeemed earth. It's not a far-fetched to say as I, I have a vision. I, I'm serious. I really, I say it with a smile, but I have a vision that I am, I just love being in the ocean. And I just love God's creation. Now, I mean, here, but mostly mostly in the tropical areas where you have all the fantastic colors. But I got to admit, I'm a little worried about some shark coming up behind me. But in the millennium, in the eternal state, I won't have to worry about that. Can you repeat what you just said coming from heaven? Jerusalem. Oh, Yes. Jerusalem, that is, there's a heavenly Jerusalem, and then there's an earthly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem will come and, and down into this present world that will be, and this is somewhat difficult, will be transformed, but God is also going to do away with the present earth and heaven. Not the heaven where God dwells but the atmosphere that has been corrupted by sin. So God is going to, like we see homes that are old homes and they build what I don't know, they used to call monster houses, right? So they're homes, but the old homes are demolished and new homes rise. That will be kind of like what will happen, happen in this present earth. It will be done away with because of sin, but in the new Jerusalem, which can accommodate uh, I think it's 20 billion people with massive room left over um, that is that's where we're headed is, is this why some preachers start preaching heaven is on earth that heaven is on earth yeah I don't know about that um, well I do know heaven is not on earth this is not heaven. That, that, we are in this present evil age. When the new Jerusalem comes is the new age, which is the eternal state. That has not happened yet. And it's not going to happen until a thousand years. So there is no heaven on earth at all. Period. End of story. That's a different age. If that's what you mean. No, what they say is the coming it's coming on earth and this earth is going to be changed and this will be the future heaven yes although it won't be this 
corrupt world, okay. it will be brand new. But but all that is part of God's redemptive plan, his restoration. Um, as I said earlier, he is not absolutely emphatically not going to let sin have the last word. He is going to have the last word. He will redeem everything, but only for those that surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. Those who refuse will spend an eternity in, they're already in Hades, but then they're going to spend an eternity in Gehenna, which is the lake of fire, which is created for the devil and his angels. Jesus speaks extensively about heaven, uh, and he speaks extensively about hell. And the two are contrasted. Conscious enjoyment in heaven, conscious suffering in hell. And I think I can make the, the, the case that man sends himself to hell. God doesn't need to send anybody to hell. Man, by his own refusal, keeps himself out of heaven. And we're going to study that when we get to Revelation chapter 20 as well. So there are different ages. There's this present evil age, the millennium, and then the eternal state. Okay, good question. Um, so uh, Revelation 5.10. So you know, you could turn this around in prayer, but I want to try to introduce that as much as I can um, I could be reading this and I could just simply say, here's where we get more out of Scripture by praying the Word of God. I'm starting to use this phrase, read a verse, pray a verse, figuratively speaking. But almost literally, you could, you could almost pray, you can pray the vast majority of Scripture. Rather than just reading it, you can turn around and pray. Why not just say, Father, thank you that you have made me to be part of your kingdom. Thank you Lord Jesus, that you have made me a priest to God the Father, and that I will reign upon the earth. Why not? So now we're not just reading the Bible, as awesome as that is, but we're interacting with the one who wrote or inspired the Word of God. Don't you think that pleases God? That we take His Word that seriously and talk to Him about it? And, and that's a way to learn how to pray. We, we all struggle with prayer at some level. And I've never met an expert in prayer. I don't plan on ever meeting an expert in prayer on this earth. We're all growing in prayer. Well, we need all the help we can get, right? I don't know about you, but I need all the help I can get when it comes to prayer. But the Bible is a prayer book. 66 books of prayer. Really, so much are literal prayers but then I can insert myself and pray so much as well. 150 prayers called the Book of Psalms, which also happen to be praise and worship songs. What does that say about God? When he calls us to sing, dance, clap, shout, jo be joyful, what does that tell you about who he is? He is a joyful God. He's pleasant. He's delightful. That he would give us that. And the joy of the Lord is our source. He wants to give us sources of abilities to overcome. And what does that say about him? So I think it's, it's, that's a good point that we should keep in mind, that Revelation is one book. But keep in mind that when you seek to interpret Scripture, you can't only try to interpret Scripture with one book. you got to look at all of Scripture Combined. That's a healthy way of approaching the Word of God. Well, um, Revelation 20. This is the big one. This speaks of the millennium. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw. You're going to see John say that over and over and over. Then I saw. I saw. I saw. Why does he do that? He is establishing credibility. And he has credibility as a highly revered apostle um, who was known as the apostle of love. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old. 
See how he goes back to Genesis? Who is the devil. Diabolos means slanderer. That's, that's his nature. And Satan, or Satan, adversary. Hebrew. And bound him for a thousand years. So Satan is going to be bound during the millennium. So he's not going to be able to te tempt sinners who are going to live through our rule and reign in complete peace, justice, and righteousness and prosperity and still serve Jesus only feigning obedience. And at the end of the millennium, they, the devil's going to be loose for a short time and they're going to come out against the camp of the saints. So man in his most pristine circumstances still can fake obedience to Jesus. That's the heart of man. God's going to give man opportunity to, to do what's right in perfection. No wicked rulers. I don't think there's any police force in the millennium. And yet, people's hearts can be so wicked that they still will not obey from the heart. Is the millennium, will that be served here on this earth? Yes. In this environment? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But it will be changed dramatically. So, well, the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. You see that in Isaiah, you see it in Micah. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, the cow and the bear will graze. The lion will eat straw like the ox, um, and a little boy will lead them. They will not hurt nor destroy, and all my holy mountain, for the knowledge of the Lord, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So the conditions of the millennium are going to be like this, but they're going to be substantially different as well. So the fact that there's no enmity between the animal world and men is is something we don't understand, although we see bits and glimpses of it, right? So it's astonishing. You see sometimes men with